it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, this is, as Sharon says, a very exciting meeting, and I, I'm looking forward to, to many of the sessions. So hopefully this talk will set the scene a little uh, for the sorts of topics we want to discuss over the next few days. I, I've called it big gaps in our knowledge about AMR, but of course what I really want to speak about is how we fill those gaps, the, the sorts of programs of, of work that the research community can undertake to do that. And that really involves producing data. Uh, one of the points about this problem, the AMR problem, is it is so big and so complicated that there is an enormous variety of data types we need to consider to turn into evidence uh, in order to move policy forward. So we need to think about how we collect data, which we're definitely not doing enough in some areas, as I'll come to, how we integrate very heterogeneous data sets, that's often a challenge, how we analyze data, and crucially, of course, right at the end, how we interpret data. I've been around in, in my field long enough to see many, many people disagree over exactly the same data, but what it means. So the interpretation is just as important as anything else. Just to introduce myself a little bit more, uh, as Sharon said, I'm at the University of Edinburgh, but I also represent an organization called Edinburgh Infectious Diseases. Um, this is a, an umbrella organization that covers not just my own university, but other universities in Edinburgh and other research institutes within the city. We're over 900 scientists researching on infectious diseases generally, and a very large portion of our effort is on AMR. And we recently undertook the exercise of organizing that a little bit. So the way it's organized is I am the lead on epidemiology. Uh, Till Backman, who's in the audience, will be uh, visible on the podium later on. He leads on diagnostics. Uh, Ros Allen on physical sciences, and David Dockrell on therapeutics. Um, but we're trying to integrate across an enormous range of activity, and, and many of your own institutes will have the same challenge as how we bring all these different people together, and this is our vehicle for doing it. Um, but again, it, it provides an illustration of the very many different strands of research that go to trying to tackle the AMR problem. So big gaps in our data. Uh, many of you all know this report, the O'Neill report that was published a few years ago. Many in the audience will have contributed to it, and like me, you will probably have the opportunity to speak uh, on, on occasion to Jim O'Neill himself. And what he always seemed to say, at least when I was there, was being an economist, new in the field, not understanding the, AMR, the history of AMR uh, research. Where are the data, he used to say. Why is the data so poor? in this field? Why, why can I not make the sort of extrapolations and calculations that, as an economist interested in the global scale of this problem, I want to do? Uh, and he was quite vocal on this point. Uh, and a lot of the report does address big gaps in our knowledge about AMR and big data. I'm going to discuss four of them in this talk, briefly. Uh, I want to talk about burden and surveillance, landscape genomics, where how we're starting to use genomics to unravel some of the patterns that we see, a completely different topic, mining the literature, uh, increasingly important, and how we might use uh, our, our knowledge and our, our data processing to Im inform research prioritization. So let's start with burden and surveillance. Now, the O'Neill report did something that I'm very, very glad they did. They emphasized loud and clear the need for surveillance data for AMR, and by implication for other areas too. And the reason I'm very glad in, I do this, that uh, they did this, is, is that I'm an epidemiologist. I use surveillance data all the time. But it is a very hard sell to most of the funders, certainly in the UK, <coughs> that surveillance is something worth supporting. It's tricky. Uh, it's not hypothesis-driven research. It's not reductionist research. It's a different kind of science. Um, and that's been a challenge and continues to be a challenge. So I'm very, very glad the O'Neill report emphasized just how important surveillance data is. There has been some definite progress in this area. People are beginning to understand that we have big gaps in our surveillance, and one of the major initiatives in the UK has been the Fleming Fund, uh, which is uh, funded by, partly by the UK government and a number of other organizations, including the Wellcome Trust, and many of us are involved in that. Uh, my university is involved by supporting some of the fellowship schemes, so we're helping to enhance capacity in lower and middle income countries for AMR and indeed other kinds of infectious disease surveillance. Uh, and there are a number of other initiatives through that scheme. But that, that's an interesting initiative. That, I haven't seen the likes of that before during my career where people are actively trying to get universities and research institutes and uh, public agencies to support this kind of capacity building. So that's great. That's progress. 
At the beginning of a meeting like this, I think it's nice to remind ourselves that although we're talking about antimicrobial resistance, antibiotics are a good thing. They are very medically valuable drugs. They have saved countless lives over the years, and they continue to do so. They, they work effectively in many different contexts. They're very valuable drugs. We use them in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we use them to treat communicable diseases caused by bacteria, a variety of those. We use them to treat endogenous bacterial infections, so conditions like sepsis, where there isn't a single etiological agent. There are multiple agents, but we need antibiotics to treat it. And we use them prophylactically. We use them to protect vulnerable patients uh, in hospitals who may be immunocompromised or undergoing invasive procedures, uh, and they need support uh, with, through antibiotics in order to survive all that. As Sally Davis likes to put it, the, the chief medical officer in the UK, antibiotics underpins much of modern medicine. So they continue to do a lot of good. The balance we have to strike is the balance between excess and access. So excess, the overuse of antimicrobials that ultimately leads to resistance and undermines the very effectiveness of the drugs we're concerned about. But access, but of course these drugs are needed by those who need them. And in many parts of the world, uh, lower and middle income countries particularly, not everyone does have that access. So there's a strong argument that we need more antibiotics, not less, in some parts of the world. And that balance is a very difficult one to get right, the, the balance between excess and access. Where do you draw the lines? How do you decide what is excess? How do you decide uh, who should be prioritized for access and what we can allow ourselves to provide for people? This is, this is uh, an important and difficult question. And we haven't started this talk well in terms of answering that sort of question because of that highlight I put out there. I said antibiotics have saved countless lives. I can't find anywhere an estimate of exactly how many lives, or even roughly how many lives, are millions, tens of millions, I don't know. There's nothing in the literature. We say these drugs are very valuable, and they clearly are, but we don't have the numbers to back it up. So we're already... Uh, in a poor shape when it comes to sorting out the excess versus access debate because we can't really put good figures uh, on the benefits they give. Now, this, is, this has been done for some diseases in some settings, some antibiotics, but it's a tricky uh, study to do, and it certainly hasn't been done across the board. Okay, what about the, the burden, the excess argument? How many people are dying today because of antimicrobial resistance? Well, there's been a number of agencies looked at that. The European CDC have looked at it. Europe, the CDC looked at it for America, and the O'Neill Review took those approaches, tweaked them a bit, and extrapolated them to the whole world. And they came up with this estimate of 700,000 deaths per year now due to antimicrobial resistance infections, and potentially this increasing to 10 million deaths a year by 2050. Now, these are difficult calculations to do, and the methodology underlying them has definitely been challenged. It's been challenged in the literature. Uh, so this paper came out in PLOS Medicine, challenging the 10 million uh, number as an extrapolation. Uh, and certainly when you look into the fine detail, there is lots to question, lots to challenge in the way that these calculations were done. But I, I wouldn't want a technical argument about the exact numbers or the best numbers we can come up to get in the way of the main message of the O'Neill report, because I think we all agree with that. And the main messages are three. First of all, AMR is already globally a very serious problem. Secondly, it's getting worse. And thirdly, it has the potential to be very, very bad indeed. And I think all the evidence that I've seen agrees with all those three claims, uh, and I think we can all probably get behind them. We probably all would agree with that. So without getting too much uh, into the detail of the numbers, I think the general underlying message is correct. Of course, if you're going to criticize somebody's numbers, somebody's extrapolations, the right way to criticize that is to do it better. And there are other people starting to do these calculations. And there's a report just out by the OECD uh, that estimates that up to 2050, 2.4 million people might die in Europe, North America, and Australia. Well, we can look at the methodology behind that and challenge that. But that's the next step in this particular debate. And these are still very large and very disturbing numbers. So we clearly have a potentially very serious problem uh, on our hands. The underlying data are not data on burden and mortality, but data on antibiotic usage and resistance, the things that ultimately go through the chain and lead to the burden that we see. And there has been some progress in the data uh, aspect of these, and particularly by an organization called CDEP, uh, represented by its director, Ramanam Laxmanarayan, who will be at this meeting uh, in a few days' time, I believe. 
And they have done really wonderful work in collating what information is available on usage and resistance, processing it, mapping it, communicating it, and using it to inform policy development. The CDEP team knows these data better than anyone. They, they know there are difficulties with all the usage data, the resistance data, the denominator data, and so on. All of it is challenging. But this is probably the best that we can do at the moment. Uh, and this team produced a lot of these sorts of outputs. Uh, the top one here is a very interesting map, uh, a paper that was published earlier this year, uh, looking at changes in medical usage of antibiotics globally. Uh, and the pattern you can see, the red is areas where in, uh, usage is increasing, and the blue is where usage is either flat or is starting to decrease in some parts of North America, Europe, and Japan. Um, so that, that's very informative data. I'll, I'll come back to how we might interpret some of that later on. But one of the interpretations they give in the paper is that perhaps this is the lower and middle income countries catching up with the levels of usage uh, that we see in other parts of the world. So how are my own group contributing to this problem of surveillance? Well, we're partners, uh, the, the senior partners in this uh, are the Danish uh, Technical University, and particularly led by my colleague Frank Airstrup, in a program called the, Glowage, sorry, big one, the Global Sewage Resistome. And this is a really innovative approach to global surveillance for AMR. A very simple idea. You gather sewage at the intakes from sewage sites all around the world, you do metagenomics on it, and you pull out the entire resistome from those data. It's extremely simple because you bypass a whole lot of ethical procedures and licensing problems and so on. You just look at the sewage. So it's a very, very promising and um, very rich data source. Uh, in, the, in the publication that's uh, it's been submitted uh, recently, we have 79 sites, 74 cities, and 60 countries. But that's growing all the time. Uh, Frank's team now has uh, information from over 100 countries wanting to be part of this particular surveillance system. The samples are done metagenomic sequencing using Illumina HiSec, uh, very rich in terms of the number of reads you get out of it. As you can imagine, there's an awful lot of DNA in sewage. Uh, and very varied in terms of the range of bacteria, over 1,500 bacteria genera that we've been able to identify so far. Now, of course, a tiny fraction of all that DNA is AMR resistance genes, but it's a significant fraction, and there is plenty of data uh, that you can pull out from this. Uh, so there's plenty of resistance genes that we've been able to identify, over 1,600 in over 400 gene groups. Uh, you can see in the top right there that the coverage isn't completely global, but it's fairly wide, so it's, it's very representative. And you can see in the bottom left that what we're getting out of these data is a lot of variation. Uh, that particular heat map is color-coded in terms of different genes that give resistance to different classes of antibiotics. And you can already see there's a lot of variation from one sample to another. So there's something to work with. These are uh, three of the analyses that Frank's team has done to try and illustrate some of the general patterns in these data. Uh, the top left one is simply a very crude measure of the relative abundance of AMR genes in total. And it's very interesting because different regions of the planet are different levels of resistance genes in their sewage. Africa is quite high, uh, as in South America. It's lower in other parts of the world. On the top right, we're picking that apart a little bit more by undertaking a principal a principal components analysis, um, comparing different parts of the world in that color coding that you can see there. Uh, and you can see, I think, quite clearly that there is a separation, that the Europe, Oceania, and North America are separating out from the rest of the world. It's quite difficult to pick out exactly what's going on there, but the main patterns that drive that are a difference in macrolides. There's more resistance to macrolides down this end of the graph, and sulfonamides and phenacols, there's more resistance up in that end of the graph. So we're seeing, again, quite clear patterns in the data uh, distinguishing different parts of the, uh, the planet. And you can do the same thing with a cluster analysis. There are two big clusters here uh, that are different. This one's dominated by Europe and North America, this one by other parts of the world. So there does seem some difference uh, between the resistomes of different parts uh, of the global sewage. How can we explain those differences? Well, the way Frank's team's gone about it is by looking at a whole lot of predictors, in this case, very simply, of the total abundance of AMR genes in the sewage sample, relative abundance of them. Uh, and they've used a whole range of predictors of essentially development, uh, numbers from the World Bank and the uh, economic development of the country and also the physical development of the country. And they've plugged these 1,500 indicators uh, into a machine learning algorithm, random forests, and that worked quite well. You can explain some 87% of the variance in AMR gene abundance 
by country through this machine learning technique. What you get there is uh, a number of factors that correlate particularly strongly. I, I haven't left the print large enough to read, but that's fairly deliberate because I don't think it matters uh, what those are. It's the general patterns that come out of these predictors, and the strongest predictors are quite consistently ones to do with the state of a country's sanitation and the state of its healthcare. A uh, little bit of economic development in there as well, but those are the strong predictors of whether you have a lot, of, a lot of resistance genes in your sewage. You can actually do that a much simpler, a more old-fashioned way. You can use GLMM uh, on a much smaller number of variables, one of which is the Human Development Index. And the Human Development Index will in it directly or indirectly include a lot of these sorts of variables in that composite measure. And that's a very strong indicator of the state of the, uh, the sewage in a particular country. And that's giving us a slightly different impression of AMR. That's giving us the impression of AMR as a problem of underdevelopment that's particularly occurring in lower and middle income countries. And there's an anomaly there, isn't there? Because when I presented that summary of the global usage data from the CDEP paper published earlier this year, the argument was that the lower and middle income countries were playing catch up. Well, if they are, in terms of the resistance genes that are appearing in their sewage, they've already overtaken the rest of the world, certainly in Africa. Now, we can and must discuss exactly why that is. Is that something about the usage data? Is it something about the sewage itself, the physical property of the sewage? What is explaining that pattern? But it's now pointing, this, what it is pointing to is that AMR may be a problem of underdevelopment as well as everything else. So we need to think about that because that's a different way of looking at it. If you want more detail on the Global Resistome Project uh, in sewage, please see the poster by Bram van Bunnik, uh, which will be presented, I think, on Wednesday morning. Uh, and there's a lot more technical detail about what goes into it there. OK, so what are we going to do with the Global Sewage Project next? Well, resistome in sewage obviously does need a lot of interpretation before you can relate it to levels of resistance in clinical patients and disease burden. And what we want to do is integrate the sewage data with other activities, things like CDEP are using in terms of uh, surveying levels of resistance worldwide and collating that information, and also a Wellcome Trust-funded program by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, led by Chris Murray, who are trying to put together information on the actual disease burden that those levels of resistance cause. We think the Global Sewage Resistome Project can feed into those processes, integrate with those processes. And the advantage of the resistome, the global sewage resistome, is that it's going to be incredibly easier to monitor what's happened. You can sample essentially a whole city and do it on a regular basis and at the very least pick out trends in those data. And I think that's going to be a very powerful tool going forward if we can integrate it satisfactorily with the other kinds of information we need to make this uh, clinically relevant. Okay, enough about sewage, although I have to say sewage will come back into the talk later on a little bit. Um, but let's switch to, to landscape genomics. And the inset here is something I managed to pull from the literature on the rapidly increasing number of bacterial genomes in the genome databases. And it's, as you would expect, increasing very fast. Now, we're in the Sanger Institute. I'm sure someone in Sanger has a better version of this graph. So please may I have it for my next talk. But I, I, I think it, it shows the message. It's increasing very, very rapidly. This is incredibly valuable data, and people at Sanger, uh, their collaborators, many people in this room have done wonderful work in interpreting this data and in the context of AMR, showing how particular bacterial lineages are circulating around the world, uh, how they're spreading antimicrobial resistance of one form or another. This is an incredibly rich source of information. It's been beautifully analyzed by, by people in this room and elsewhere. But I'm an epidemiologist. What's in N NCBI is a mess. It's from all different studies all over the world. They have different purposes, different sampling frames, different protocols, everything. It's not a unified data source. So it is quite difficult to make sound epidemiological inferences uh, from data like this. You can do it if you set your data very carefully. But we went back to basics. And in our work, we have decided to collect the data ourselves. And we've done it in a particular context. This is uh, genomic data for E. coli in Nairobi, in Kenya. It's part of what's known as the Urban Zoo Project. This is led by my colleague, Eric Fevre, from the University of Liverpool. And Eric set up a wonderful sampling scheme here. We have taken the city of Nairobi, and we've done a structured survey across the human population of it, 
the livestock population of it. There are a lot of livestock, a lot of urban livestock in Nairobi, and also the wildlife population. Now, of course, we're not talking elephants and lions here, although there is the national park right by the airport, um, but mostly we're talking rats, pigeons, marabou storks, and things like that. Um, but there's a lot of wildlife in Nairobi too. Um, we've been able to, through this structured sampling program, get over 1,600 whole genomes of E. coli. You can use those, of course, to type E. coli. You're finding in different parts of the city and in these different compartments, and to do phylogenetics and discrete traits analysis and anything else you want to do with these kinds of data. I'll just give you a, a very small flavor of the sorts of information that we're generating from this, again, incredibly rich data source. And it's not just the genomes, of course, it's the very structured collection of metadata that goes with it that makes this a particularly valuable resource. Uh, so here's uh, one example. Uh, this is work done by Brian Wee, a colleague at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and Brian's been looking at core genome MLST pairwise distances. If you find that particular measure behaves slightly more tidily compared with the conventional SNPs, but it, it gives you similar sorts of information. And we're looking at SNP distances here. And the SNP distances can get very large. On the bottom axis, this goes out to thousands. So I've honed in on very closely related isolates within this data set. Uh, and what we've done in this plot is divide those up you know, on a spatial basis from isolates that were taken from the same household, which is a, a relatively small number of comparisons, versus isolates that were taken from different households, which is a much larger number of comparisons. We had over 99 uh, households in this data set. You can immediately see, without me giving you the statistics, that those are very different distributions. And what we are seeing within households is a huge over-representation of very closely related E. coli genomes. Uh, and somewhere in there, there's a, a threshold. Uh, we've just, for the time being, taken that as 15 a distance of 15 on the CGMLST scale. So they are different. What is that telling us? Well, it, to interpret that data, I, I put it this way. The E. coli are not mixing across the city of, Iro of Nairobi uh, faster than core genome MLST differences are accumulating within a household. So this is giving you both spatial and temporal information on how E. coli are mixing. And they're not doing it so fast that we can't see a very, very clear signal at the household level. Households in Nairobi are differently stable, but many households are stable for of the order of maybe years. This is very different from the work that perhaps Sharon Group has done in hospital wards, which are turning over much, much faster. So house households are more stable than that. So you can see the signal, in a sense, going further back in terms of the pairwise distances between genomes. You have a longer time frame to work with. And there are some clear patterns there, as you can see. The other thing you can do, and remember this was a large collection of genomes from different compartments, uh, over 179 sharing events between humans, livestock, and wildlife, and that's just the ones that happen to be between humans and livestock. Now, that's actually not a huge number of sharing events, and if you think about the ecology of the system, this is a city. These are urban livestock. These are people and livestock living in extremely close proximity. And if these aren't going to share their E. coli, no one is. This is about as close as it gets. And we're still only seeing a restricted number of sharing events between humans and livestock. We've just begun to analyze these data, so these are very preliminary results. And if you don't tweet one thing from this talk, please don't tweet this bit, because it really is very, very early, early days. Um, but these pie charts are simply color-coded for the different kinds of sharing between humans between livestock and between wildlife. And I've separated again between ones from the same household and different household. And what you can see immediately from the pie charts is there's a lot more yellow in this one. The yellow is livestock to livestock sharing. Now, what does that, how do we interpret that? Well, humans are very mobile in Nairobi. They go all over the place, so it's not surprising they share E. coli around with other places. So are the wildlife. They're not restricted. They can go anywhere too. Many of these are birds. Livestock are not. If you're a livestock in Nairobi, you're probably going to live in the same location your entire life. These are very stationary. And that, you can see that very clearly by comparing those two. The, the, the livestock are not sharing with other livestock between the households very often. The other thing you can see from this, uh, you have to look at three colors now, so purple, blue, and green. Those represent sharing events evolving wildlife. Those are much more represented in the lower pie chart than the upper pie chart. That just suggests, at least as a working hypothesis, that the wildlife are disproportionately involved in sharing E. coli strains. 
that they're essentially vectors of E. coli within this city. That's a new idea. That's something you wouldn't probably have inferred without the genome data to inform you. Um, so we're still working on this. So these are very provisional interpretations, very provisional conclusions. But I highlight it just to show the extraordinary richness of applying genome data combined with carefully structured epidemiological surveys and doing the right kinds of analysis on it. Uh, and we can learn a lot from doing that. Okay, let's um, switch subjects uh, completely now and talk about mining the literature. That is becoming more and more a challenge, as any, any new PhD students in the audience will know if they've had to do their literature reviews on AMR in the last few months. The number of papers on AMR is increasing rapidly. I just pulled those figures from the Web of Science uh, last week or so, but they're increasing very rapidly. And for all of us who want evidence-based policymaking, that our evidence that we give to the policymakers should be based on the literature, that is an awful lot of material we have to get on top of. We, it is incumbent on us to know what's in those thousands and thousands of papers that are coming over. And I don't know if any of you are involved in uh, World Health uh, Organization activities where they're surveying expert opinion to decide what their particular policy recommendations will be. It is now no longer enough just to be an expert. These processes are now formal. They go through a systematic review process, an evaluation process of all the literature. So we have to have processes in, in place that allow us to do that efficiently, accurately, and get, reach the right interpretations. We have been doing that in, in my group in the context of carbapenem-resistant organisms. Now, these are obviously important. Uh, this is one of the outputs of one of those systematic reviews the WHO did uh, that came up uh, last year, I think. This is the priority pathogens list in terms of new antibiotics. And you'll see right at the top of this, all the organisms involved are carbapenem resistant. That's where the WHO sees the priority as being. And there was a very nice paper last year published on mapping the growing CRO problem, carbapenem resistant organism, uh, organism problem around the world uh, that illustrates very nicely that just what a big problem this is going, is potentially going to be, or at the very least how fast it's growing. So, uh, Shen Guangzhou and my group, working very closely, I might mention, with colleagues at the Health Protection Scotland on this project, has done a formal systematic review of what's available, not for levels of CRO infection, but for risk factors. So what actually informs our understanding of who's at risk of this. Uh, she had a formal protocol for doing this. She looked at quality control. She looked at publication bias. She did it to the highest professional standards that, that we're able to do. She found a lot of papers, over 250, uh, accelerating very rapidly in the last few years. A fairly good global representation, though not perfect, uh, but there's a lot of international concern about this. There is a huge amount of work in 254 published risk factor studies. A massive amount of data and an awful lot of effort has gone into that. So how do we produce some sort of interpretation, an overall interpretation of, of those papers? Well, the first thing to note, and Shen Guan looked into this very carefully, she actually uh, formalized a, a search for heterogeneity. So we're looking for heterogeneity by meta-regression, and she turned out a number of elements of these studies that were significantly attributing to heterogeneity between them. Basically means they're not a homogenous bunch of studies. They differ in terms of study organism, case control selection, study population, sample size, study setting, specialty involved. And that matters in terms of which risk factors are coming out significant or the value of the odds ratio. So these heterogeneities are significant. They matter. So you have to account for them in some way. So what Shen Guan's done, I think quite an elegant way of solving the problem, is she has done meta-analysis, so she's produced pooled odds ratios from all these different studies for all 77 risk factors, but in a two-dimensional plot where she's also looked at the percentage of studies in which these were significant. So that's some way of getting behind into the heterogeneity of these studies. Sometimes you see very strong effects in some settings and no effects in others, and that's accounted for here. And you could see quite a cluster of different risk factors that are coming out as significant. So let's have a close look at what those are. Well, some of them are very reassuring. They're what you'd expect. Uh, this one over here, which is consistently coming out as a very strong risk factor, is whether that particular patient, CROs, had previously been detected in that patient. You'd expect that, and it comes out as probably the top risk factor. These ones are also reassuring. If that patient had previously, be, previously been exposed to carbapenems, then that's a very strong risk factor. But there are other risk factors in there that are almost as strong and certainly as consistent. Some of them we know about. 
Uh, those two are about invasive medical procedures, uh, so uh, nasogastric tubes uh, or mechanical ventilation, for example. These ones are about hospitalization more generally. So this one's about whether or not the patient had previously been in an ICU, an intensive care unit. And this one's technically a comorbidity, but it's actually bed sores, which may be a direct risk factor for CROs, but they may just be a marker for being in hospital and being very poorly for a lengthy, uh, lengthy period. So these are vulnerable patients. These ones are interesting. These are other antibiotics, not carbapenems. Now, there's a lot of antibiotics in this diagram. Uh, people have been quite interested in this. They're all the orange ones. There's a lot down here, which are the more routine antibiotics that you might find in a general uh, practice or, or a general clinic, not just a hospital. These ones are a group of antibiotics that are mostly used to treat hospital-acquired infections. So things like MRSA, things like VRE. So these are also markers for being in hospital. So how do we interpret this? Are all those risk factors distilled from an incredible body of work from around the world, really risk factors that directly influence the patient's risk, or are they simply markers for patients being in hospital and being in intensive care for lengthy periods? These are very vulnerable patients. Now that interpretation of all these data really matters because at the patient level, most of these things are not going to be modifiable. If a patient is very sick, they're very sick. They're going to be in a hospital. They're going to be in an ICU. They're going to have mechanical ventilation if they need it. There's nothing to be done about this. So it changes the emphasis. It changes the emphasis from the patient to the facility. And it becomes the, the, the carbapenem resistant organisms become a problem of the facility. So obviously it is correct that routine screening for colonization in patients and coming into the facility should be done. That's part of the story. But the emphasis changes to focusing on the facility and not the patient. Now, if, if that's correct, if that interpretation is correct, and we could certainly discuss it, one way of trying to sort it out is by having hypothesis-driven epidemiological studies, is to go in with very focused studies to try and tackle that particular question. Well, we would like to do that. We would like to do our own case control study in Scotland, and Shenguan has been starting to do this. The data are there. We have lots of very detailed data in the Scottish health system on patients who have been tested and found to have carbapenem uh, resistant organisms uh, and a lot of metadata that goes with that. But of course we have to access this data. As university researchers we have to access it. In Scotland, as in much of the UK and many places elsewhere, that has become a very, very bureaucratic process. Extremely challenging. For good reasons. People want to protect patient privacy. So the data are being protected for that, for that reason. I don't think there's adequate balance here against patient privacy with the benefits of doing the research. These are potentially lethal organisms. The research that Sheng Wan's doing and that other people are doing on this and other topics, that has the potential to save lives. And that needs to be included when we're coming up with this balance between protecting patient privacy and the benefits of research. So where's the balance at the moment? Well, to do our own case control study, one of the 254 uh, that are around the world, we've had to deal so far with five different agencies. We wouldn't have got through this process without working closely with Health Protection Scotland. It's taken actually more than 12 months now, hundreds of person hours, and at least half, if not three quarters, of the costs of doing the entire project. And this is for a, for a PhD project. Now, in my group, and I'm sure many of you are the same, We've been putting PhD students on research for risk factors or demographic trends or whatever in all sorts of medical uh, infections. We, we deal with infectious diseases. So this is very common for us. And we've been doing it for 20 years, ever since I, I moved to the University of Edinburgh. I'm not going to do it anymore. That's it. This is the last project I'm going to put a PhD on this. You can't get the data in a timely fashion. It is simply too difficult. So, so we're pulling out of that kind of research done in that way because we simply can't get the data. We do, of course, in the UK, have an organization, Health Data Research UK, that has a remit to address this problem. Uh, their job is to enable research that will have a long-lasting impact on improving the health of the public. Well, I'd certainly argue that Sheng Wan's research fits that bill. Where's the enabling? There's no enabling here. This is getting progressively more difficult year on year to do this kind of research. And as I say, we, we're, we're stopping doing it. Let's move to a more positive note. Research prioritization. Uh, I showed this earlier on where the, the World Health Organization, through 
evidence-based uh, studies has come up with the idea that carbapenem-resistant organisms are of the highest priority. And there's an interesting corollary of that. Basically, what they're saying is organisms that are resistant to last-line drugs are the highest priority. Well, that's something that you could think about and maybe challenge. And again, in Edinburgh, this is something we've been doing. Uh, and this is work led by Megan Perry and Luke McNally. Uh, Luke, in particular, has developed a, a mathematical model of exactly this question. Should you prioritize first-line or last-line drugs? The concept is very simple. It's called an SI model. There are susceptible and infected people in it. The infected people can have four kinds of infection, ones that are resistant to a first-line drug, a last-line drug, there are only two in this system, uh, or neither or both. Uh, symptomatic cases, as you would, are treated with the first line, then the last line drug. We track treatment failures. That's our way of keeping score to see how well the intervention is doing. It's quite a complicated model because it doesn't just have epidemiology. It has evolution, the selection for resistance, costs of resistance, bystander selection, asymptomatic carriers, and so on. And Luke modeled three kinds of intervention which are designed to try and improve the way that this treatment regime avoids treatment failures. So one is to try and protect the efficacy of either your drugs, but including the first-line drug, perhaps by giving other antibiotics in conjunction with it, perhaps by changing an adjuvant, various ways you might think about doing that and that could be researched. Uh, one is by using diagnostics, just to detect whether your patient is resistant to a first-line uh, first drug or last-line drug, whether their infection is resistant to that, or introducing a new antimicrobial as a first-line drug or last-line drug. And Luke's team has explored this over a huge range of parameter space, so lots and lots of different scenarios, but for all realistic parameters, we get a very robust result. Prioritizing your first-line drugs gives you a bigger reductions in burden or treatment failures. Uh, and that's the difference between the blue lines and the red lines in these graphs. So the dynamics are different depending on what you're doing, and that they can vary from scenario to scenario, but consistently, the blue line is below, at least for part of the time, the red line. So we should be, according to that analysis, prioritizing first-line drugs. Is that what we're doing? Well, Luke's team has also looked at measures of effort, research effort, into the various antibiotics that, that we use, all 13 classes. Um, that means accessing the global usage data uh, that's been published by uh, Van Berkel et al. a few years ago, and comparing that with different measures of research effort, so the amounts of grants, publications or attention that's been paid to these different uh, drugs. And that's fairly consistent across the different drugs. And the consistent answer is there is no correlation between usage and effort whatsoever. So the most used drugs, things like penicillin, are not researched or not have as much research profile as carbapenems, which are only a tiny fraction of the same level of usage. That comparison for funding is up there. So there's more funding going to carbapenems than there is to penicillins. Penicillins is still the most widely used drug in the world. The, the first line, last line argument is actually quite a simple one. If we can protect penicillins, if penicillins are more effective, we're not going to need the carbapenems, the last line drugs, nearly so much. So we protect them too. So there's a sort of double benefit to doing more research on the drugs that are most used and also protect the last line drugs. I always like to ask a question at this point. How many people here are working on penicillin? I've worked on penicillin. Now, I always get that, maybe one or two hands at the most. We're not working on penicillin. It's an incredibly important drug worldwide, and nobody's studying it. Why is that? Because we're putting all our effort into carbapenems, which hardly anyone ever needs. It, it's an interesting way of prioritizing our research. So that's, that's the World Health Organization view. Our view is... It's a simple English phrase that sums this up. Take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves. Look after the things like penicillins and you'll have a lot less bother with the last line drugs like carbapenems. You won't need them so much, there won't be so much resistance developing to them and so on. So that's a completely different prioritization. So I'm afraid we do rather challenge the WHO on that one as whether they've got their priorities right. But the point is not so much winning a debate, the point is that those sorts of decisions can be informed by evidence. You can do research to find out what you actually should be doing research on, uh, and we've done it on that particular occasion. Okay, just to, to wrap up, where are we now? What's the, what's the state of play with 
the big gaps in our knowledge about AMR and the sorts of data that we're able to use to fill them. Well, lots and lots of reports about recent progress in managing AMR usage and resistance levels and so on. One of those has just come out last week from NAHS Scotland. Uh, and that has a couple of very interesting graphs on it. And I think these are fairly reflective of what's going on in many parts of the world at the moment. So this figure shows that in Scotland, the total use of antibiotics in humans uh, as DDDs per thousand people per day is starting to fall. It's gone down by about 3% over the last few years. So that's, that's encouraging. However, that plot masks that most of that fall is actually in the communities. So the GPs are doing their bit. Uh, it's coming down. In our acute hospital setting, it's still going up, and it's going up quite fast, 18% increase. So that's worrisome. We are reliant even more on antibiotics now than we were a few years ago in the hospitals in Scotland. The data on resistance are not quite so easily plotted, um, but there are a couple of lines in the, in the report that summarise them. AMR in humans is generally stable in Scotland. However, for some important organisms, and there they mean the CROs and also multidrug-resistant gonorrhea, uh, susceptibility is increasing, or non-susceptibility non -susceptibility, non -susceptibility is increasing. And in animals, again, the data are uh, less strong here, but I mean, the trends you can try and pick out, AMR also appears to be general, generally stable. So there's um, some progress being made there in Scotland. Is it enough? Well, we're always asking for, for more progress from, from the policymakers and the health agencies. I, I've, I've been doing this, writing articles, people like Jeremy Farrar, Ramanan Lixman Orion, uh, and many other people in the audience elsewhere have been doing the same thing, trying to move the debate forward from the scientific evidence to the need for action on AMR. What we're doing, of course, is trying to influence bodies such as this, the high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance in a special session of the UN General Assembly held over two years ago. Now, what those uh, actions do, in this particular case on a global scale, is express what we all think we need to do to manage the AMR crisis better. And we hope that the recommendations that come out of the UN or our national agencies or the FAO or the OIE or whoever it may be will lead to change. They will lead to change in how antimicrobials are used, how patients are managed, and so on. And this is the crucial step that those changes will be enough to reverse or at least halt the trends we are seeing in increasing resistance. Uh, and that's a bit that's a worry. Are we doing enough? How will we know that the targets we set, and should we meet the targets, whether they're met, will actually be enough to halt this problem? Um, my concern about that goes back to something that you won't have noticed in my summary of the Scottish report on AMR. But there was a line in there that said, at the root of the resistance problem is the misuse of antibiotics. That's wrong. The bacteria don't care whether the antibiotics were given where a patient desperately needed them from a clinical point of view, or, or didn't, or there was a misdiagnosis or whatever. They don't care about that at all. All antibiotics are the same from that perspective. It's not just misuse. Legitimate use is also generating resistance. And so the question is, is the amount of legitimate use we have at the moment in livestock as well as humans, is that sustainable? Are we doing enough? And that comment in, in the NHSS report, I, I've heard echoed by clinicians as well, that the job here is to, is to stop the wasteful use, the unnecessary use. Now, I, is that going to be enough? I'm not so sure. But of course, it's not me who gets to decide. It's not the UN that gets to decide. It's not any of us who gets to decide. those guys get to decide. We will find out, and we will find out in our lifetimes in this room, whether or not we are doing enough. I'm concerned about that. I'm not sure about it. Um, but the way we can do better is to generate more information. Better data, big data, better synthesis, better analysis, and giving the policymakers the right kinds of evidence based on our analyses and interpretations of those data. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, many people who've contributed to the ideas in this. I hope I've managed to mention most of them as I've gone along. Uh, a wide variety of funders, including the Wellcome Trust, but also a, a long string of uh, support from e various EU programs, uh, and also a, a thank you to NHS Scotland and to Health Protection Scotland. Thank you very much.
that's excellent. Um, that, that talk really sets the scene very nicely for us, I think, because um, it actually raised some new hypotheses. It was actually quite challenging in, in the way we think about things. And so I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting uh, questions in response to that. So thank you very much. That was really outstanding. So uh, questions? Uh, I agree. That was a great opener, Mark. Uh, this is Lance Price from George Washington University. Um, I, since there's extra time, I have two questions. One, you know, looking at your data, your global sewage data, and uh, this idea that while some of these developing countries may not have as much use as, as you know, North America, for instance, but you're seeing this, a lot of antibiotic resistance. Could that be due to, if you have poor wastewater treatment and poor drinking water treatment, a little bit of antibiotics could go a long way because you have a nice distribution system for the drug resistant bacteria that you're selecting and the few individuals that you're treating. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to the question, but it, it's, a, it's a very good point. So that, and that actually is Frank Airstrup's interpretation of this. So one of, one of the issues is, it, it, well, he calls it just spread. So the environment in some cities anyway in Africa and Asia is much more conducive to when you have resistant organisms, those spreading. So it, it, it's the, the spread versus origins discussion. Um, and that certainly could be a factor. Um, that my, my point in presenting that data was this is an interesting pattern. It's one we weren't expecting, we hadn't seen before, and we need to interpret it, whether that's the right interpretation or anything else. But that's certainly a possibility. And then a uh, quick question. So are you using Malditoff or anything to look for uh, drug byproducts, so what people would excrete, so you could look if there's any correlation? Uh, yes, and there isn't. And what? And there isn't. There isn't? No. no. That sounds like a conversation over the, over the bar in, in later on. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Um, so you say that it's important we get data, and I totally agree, absolutely. But it's also what we do with it. So I was quite surprised, I was looking up the other day, that um, for gonorrhea in the UK, we know, because we do surveillance, that 84% of gonorrhea in the UK is sensitive to penicillin. <laughs> yeah, we don't use penicillin to treat gonorrhea, because we have to use last-line drugs. You know, it's, it's, more, it's also about, you know, we already have that data, and yet we're not using it in any sensible way. I, I can only agree and look around to anybody who's re responsible for clinical prescribing guidelines <laughs> to, uh, to, to comment on that. Um, no, I, 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 think, I think there's lots of scope for, for managing the way we treat particular infections. Um, but as you know, it's actually a rather cumbersome process to change treatment guidelines. I mean, this is not something you can do at the snap of the fingers and not on the basis of a couple of papers that people have published. It's, it takes a lot more effort than that. Um, and that's actually an important point. If we want to change our practices in any ways, there is, tends to be a quite a long lag before we can actually do that effectively. Um, the bacteria are not, they're not waiting for us, of course. Uh, while we dither, uh, they get on with it, developing resistance, so it's a challenge. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Carl Christensen. I come from Landspital University Hospital in Reykjavik. You described the uh, meta-analysis of the risk factors for gabapenemesis and the uh, uh, risk factors mainly associated with hospitals. But, uh, probably they are not created, they have a, a spread there. So and most of the, uh, uh, the papers that were analyzed probably from developed countries rather than developing countries. I suppose that the risk factors would be completely different or at least some way different if they were done in India. What do you think? Yes, I, I think you're right, and um, we, we've gone to some effort to point out the, the, the heterogeneity between studies, and there is, there is absolutely a lack of data um, from, from LMICs uh, on that. Uh, and I think that that's a general concern. A, a lot of our information, we, we, we say it's global, but there are significant gaps in it, and we, we, we don't have all the information we need from all parts of the world. Um, that, that's, that's WHO territory, isn't it? Uh, and they're, they're tasked with making sure that's happened. But um, when the WHO did their survey 2014 of uh, just levels of resistance in certain key organisms and, and sent them off to all the member states uh, around the world, they got a very, very patchy response from that. So, so not, not everyone is uh, providing the data and sharing their data even, even with the WHO agencies. 
Um, and and that, that really needs to change. Hello, um, very fantastic and inspiring talk. Um, I'm very fascinated by the, actually the data of the Savage system. So we are working in New York on sequencing of subways on a global scale. And what we see is actually that we see accumulation around hospitals and we can actually follow transmission routes of amputic resistance. And that actually would be also perfectly possible with your data set and would be very exciting to see if you see accumulation around hospitals. So um, Megan Perry in Edinburgh has also got her own project, which is on sequencing um, sewage outflows from, in fact, not just a hospital, but from different parts of the hospital, it's the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. Um, and that's fascinating. Uh, you can see in different sections of the hospital, from acute care to chronic care and so on, different resistance coming out in the sewage. I mean, you can see it quite clearly. And those, of course, are all flowing into... Uh, the general sewage system in Edinburgh. We don't see that signal when we get right down to the general sewage works at the, at the end of the city. So the question is, is, is it still there or has it been completely diluted out uh, by the time you actually get... But, but one of the things we have to try and sort out with the global sewage one is whether or not we have hospitals in our catchments, although most of them will. Um, and that will certainly have at least a local impact on what you're seeing. Thank you for that very enlightening um presentation. I'm Shamsuddin Ali from Ahmad Bello University, Zaria. Um, it was quite interesting to note that um, there have been a lot of work, there's a lot of work going on on carbapenems um, and less on the first line drugs. So I was just wondering what, um, what do you see with regards to research um, on drugs such as cholestine, tegacycline and phosphomycin, which are the ones that are used when carbapenems do fail? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, th I think what I better do is show you that graph um, and discuss it with you so that you, you can have a look. But uh, the polymyxins are in there. So, so we, we have the data for, uh, for the polymyxins. Um, but I, 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 from recollection, they are also over-researched. Uh, and certainly colistin has had rather a high research profile uh, recently. Um, but but the, the penicillins, the aminoglycosides, everything else, not. So I think it's quite a consistent pattern. Now, if, if you remember, the summary statistic was there is zero correlation between usage and research effort. So it's just, it isn't there. I'd just like to make a comment rather than, than a question, and it's really to follow up on Julian's point. Um, as a clinician, when the patient turns up in front of you, you don't know whether the bug that they've got is antibiotic sensitive or antibiotic resistant. And so our inclination is to treat them you know, with a broad spectrum antibiotics so that we make sure that we cover the ones, the minority that have resistant bugs. And certainly in the GUM population, you often ha only have one chance to treat that patient. So it's really hard. So unless you can come up with a diagnostic that we can use in the clinic and give us an answer in 15 minutes, um, this isn't going to change anytime soon. So I'm just defending the clinicians. I don't know how many there are in the audience, but, uh, you know, <laughs> um, we know we know the epidemiology, but the individual patient in front of you um, you have to treat the best way that you can because you don't often have another opportunity. No, I agree entirely, and I know that. You know, I'm just, just, I'm just so staring at it. More diagnostics but, but, then. But it does tie into what Mark said in his talk. Mm -hmm. you know, look after the penis because you know, if, you can, if you can find a way to use the first-line antibiotics effectively, which means point-of-care tests, and yes, that comes back to us as researchers to develop them, but it also comes back to you as clinicians to ask for them because often you don't, and, and you know, that there needs to be that... Um, drive, not to just go and collect information, but actually use that information to develop point of care tests and push that part of it as well. And, and I have to say, I, I don't believe that prescribing guidelines can't be changed. And I don't believe it because we've had to change them in the last few years. We often have to change them. So it can be done. What we don't do is change them in anticipation of a problem, which I, I think is what you're going to do. And maybe we need to rethink that quite hard. We, we're, we're, current, we're constantly prescribing is constantly catching up with the profile of resistance. It's not anticipating it. I think that's a worry. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for the nice talk. Um, just want to comment on your, on your work on global sewage resistance. We know for sure, like, uh, in the sewage during sampling, these bugs are not only exposed to antibiotic, they're also exposed, for example, for, with antiseptics, disinfectants. I know, we know all these chemicals can partly like drive the selective pressure to these bergs. So did you also look at that? But also the second thing, uh, you sample the sewage, which partly 
accounts for human. But then, what about the animals? We know that, like in animals, we also have a lot of problems. We have also agents, which antimicrobial agents, which are used in animals, and sometimes at a higher doses compared to what we use in humans. So what's your comment on that as well? Thanks. Uh, so so the, the second one first, because it's easier. Um, we, we've done a very detailed characterization of basically the sewage microbiome, and it looks reassuringly like human feces. There is, there is not, obviously, a large component from agriculture or anything else. I mean, I'm not saying there's not none. There will be. Uh, but it is reassuring like human feces. But you're absolutely right. That's something that we have to factor in. And there may be anomalous sites where they are getting contamination from agricultural sources. Uh, and I've now completely forgotten your first question. I'm sorry. I think it was heavy, heavy metals um, or metals. Yeah. Yep. yeah. In, in, the, in the sewage, specifically. Uh, no. So that's, that would be an interesting thing to look for. We're at the very early stages of this. So thank you for the suggestion. Um, it's a, maybe it's a question, maybe it's a comment on, the, the, on some of the bias within the sewage uh, study. Um, a lot of people in the lowest income countries that don't have access to antibiotics also don't have access to sewage systems. So they're not actually being sampled in that study. And so I, I just hope that the, the reading of, oh, there's more resistance here. I mean, if you're sampling an urban center and people use antibiotics more there, they abuse them more, and so it's a different population from the population that needs access to antibiotics. Uh, that's an excellent point uh, and a very good suggestion, and we, in fact, uh, Hannah Lepper, who's in the audience, one of her jobs is to try and characterize more precisely the populations that are actually contributing to the sewage in exactly the way that you mean. So uh, watch this space. We, we, we recognize that point, and we're trying to address it. So thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Till Bachmann, Edinburgh University. So Mark, I really enjoyed your talk and uh, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, it took not long that point of care diagnostics was mentioned in the comments. Uh, just to put a little bit in, or uh, add to that. Uh, we, we speak a lot about uh, speed and affordability with rapid diagnostics and uh, just to put a number out in the beginning. So 30 minutes is the time to result which is required. Uh, by the longitude price, so if we think about the technologies which we may have in the audience and which, which we have, uh, will hear about, this is the, about the mark. And then the affordability um, in the areas which we have now spoken about um, in, uh, in countries which are, have less access to, it's uh, compared to the cost of a dosage of an antibiotic. And so that's in India, it's 100 rupees, for example. So we have a real challenge. We would like to have rapid diagnostics. We have the technologies. But meet these criteria is a, is a big, big ask. Just as a comment. Uh, Till, I, I, I can only agree. Um, it, is, it is not obvious to me that we will have rapid diagnostics for everything we need them for on the time scales we need them. So this is absolutely not to say we shouldn't be looking for the diagnostics. We, we categorically should. But we have to not be relying on that as, as the way that we're going to solve this problem. Um, um, th there are other things we have to do at the same time. Right, well, I'm going to wrap this session up with just uh, perhaps one comment right. before I, I thank you very much. The comment is that um, increasingly now, I've heard uh, speakers refer to the uh, association between AMR and um, issues of sanitation and deprivation, which really links us through to the development goals and AMR is not mentioned in the development goals. And I think that the challenge of dealing with AMR when it's on such a scale that we need to deal with sanitation and deprivation is a big challenge indeed. And I think that really moves the way we're thinking about AMR uh, prevention and, and uh, dealing with the threat. Um, so I was really pleased that you picked up on that. I think it's a really big issue for, for us to be bearing in our minds when we're thinking about how to tackle AMR. But, that was really an outstanding talk for, uh, for us today. Thank you so much. And I'd like to just um, thank you again in the usual way. Thank you.